Well, hello everyone and welcome. I'm Louise, Curator of Natural History for the High Desert Museum. Thank you so much for attending this Natural History Pub and thanks as always to our loyal museum members for helping to make this and our other events possible. We would also like to thank our programme sponsors, Fairfield Inn and Suites, the Pacific Northwest Forest Association, also known as Old Smokies, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. We do have tech support available tonight if you have any issues. Thank you to our wonderful designer, Kyle, for being here to assist. At the bottom of the Zoom window, you should see a chat function and that will allow you to ask questions throughout the talk. And at the end of the presentation, we'll select a few questions from there. Without further ado, I'm so delighted to introduce our speaker tonight. Dr. Linda Jurofki is Professor of Anthropology at Eastern Oregon University. She received a bachelor's degree in anthropology from Appalachian State University and a master's and PhD in anthropology from the University of Oregon. She has spent the last 20 years teaching anthropology and or working as an applied anthropologist with tribes and as an archeologist. Her research interests are varied, including nutritional and medical anthropology, native peoples of North America and archeology. span she has received funding from the Northwest Health Foundation, as well as the National Institute of Health to study childhood obesity in rural communities. She currently serves as Eastern Oregon University Board of Trustees. Welcome, Linda, and thank you so much again for joining us tonight. Thank you um, very much. And I'd like to add to that um, I actually have rotated off the board, uh, but I really appreciate the kind introduction that you gave me. Um, as Louise indicated, I have been at Eastern Oregon University for the last 20 years, but to give you some context behind some of my experiences is that I have had uh, really varied opportunities. Uh, before um, ending up teaching at EOU, I actually worked for the Burns Paiute Tribe and actually also worked with tribes up in Alaska as well as Washington. And so the Camp Kersey Mining District is something that I've been working at since about 2007, 2008. And it's been a really uh, fortunate opportunity for me. Um, at Eastern Oregon University, I have opportunity to get funding, uh, especially do summer research, as well as taking students out to do research at Camp Carson. The other thing too is that for at Willow Whitman National Forest, um, they've been incredibly supportive of the research and it's really led into um, a almost two decade relationship of doing research on the forest. Uh, one of their archeologists is a former student of mine, Eric Harvey, and I've um, collaborated with him on the forest doing archeological work and also taking students out. And uh, the Wallow Whitman National Forest actually uh, supported the research that we did at Camp Carson and we're still doing and uh, has uh, served to put in uh, individuals that have cleared the area so that we can do better archeological work. Now, um, Camp Carson actually far before I started doing research at it um, was uh, research at one part of it at Two Dragon Camp in the 1990s by Dr. George Mead, who was also in uh, the Lagrand region. And uh, he did many years of study and took students there. And what happened after the 1990s is that the Forest Service really didn't continue doing much research there at all. And it ended up the vast majority of this mining district, any parts that were really cleared, um, were overgrown, um, really a tremendous tree load on the region. And so it was difficult actually to find. And so when we went up there to find it, uh, it was actually sort of ironic, and you'll see in a slide later in the presentation, that it can be difficult to get to, um, depending on the route that you take. But the primary part of my research was in the man, main camp or town. It's about uh, 20 acres or so. And it turned out that at least uh, the work that George Mead did really led well into the kind of research I did. And one reason why uh, Camp Carson was divided up that way is because Two Dragon Camp was occupied by Chinese miners in the area who also worked um, in hand with 
the white miners that were at the main camp. Um, it was definitely segregated, although it's evident that they were trading back and forth. And you'll see some of the um, uh, collection that we have taken off of Camp Carson. Other thing is about this project, it's really been a community project. Uh, there are a number of individuals that are in the region of Northeast Oregon that either um, are descendants of individuals that mined at Camp Carson and or have lived uh, next to it or in the region of it and have a lot of information. And so what's happened is, is that we've been really fortunate is that we've been able to um, do some oral histories with individuals that are associated with Camp Carson, um, including uh, uh, ironically uh, a family that's lived just outside of it for the vast majority of their lives. The other part of the community outreach is that we've been able to um, bring in uh, groups like the Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts to do research there, which has been an incredible process um, by introducing archaeology and anthropology uh, to young kids. And finally, university classes. Uh, at Eastern Oregon University, we offer archaeology on campus once a year. It's pretty much the fall is the best time to take students out. And uh, we've taken probably 250 students um, during this last decade or so out to do research and to learn really hands-on work of doing archaeology. Uh, so to give you some context about Camp Carson and how there ended up being a mining district there, Mining in the West, and especially in Oregon outside of California, had a lot to do with the, really the second wave of mining in the region. Um, part of that is that really gold had mostly played out in California um, by the 1870s, 80s, and people were moving on to other gold mines and looking for other riches. Other thing too is it's important to think about of why people were at Camp Carson and other mines in this region had to do a lot with wages. Um, on the East Coast, people barely <laughs> made a living, literally. And what happened is if you could get into a mining district, um, working for a company and or was a successful gold miner individually, you could make a lot of money fairly quickly. Um, unfortunately, is that it was more of a feast or famine. And uh, for gold mining, if you got on a, a good uh, gold mine, you could make a fortune. But if you didn't, uh, you really suffered a lot. The other thing is, is that why folks were flocking to the West to do gold mining is because they were leaving Europe and trying to find a better life. And so it's fairly evident, at least from the stories that have been handed down in this region related to this mine, is that you had a lot of individuals from the East Coast and Europe coming West to find their fortune. Um, the other thing uh, that's important to note is that uh, this was a time where records weren't kept everywhere like it is today. Um, and you could be anonymous. You could start over your life um, be a new person, change your name. And there's a lot of historical documentation that shows that a lot of men and women did this very thing. Um, the other thing that really tied in with mining in the West is that people were uh, really escaping uh, the post-Civil War period and they wanted to get West. Part of that goal is to get money and land and um, to find a new life. What we do know is that we more than likely had folks that served during the Civil War because we found bullet casings um, associated with Civil War um, uh, weapons that were handed out to individuals. And so that was a pretty exciting find um, when we were doing research there. Um, the other thing too is um, mining camps vary greatly. Um, and uh, to give you really context is that the Camp Carson mine at its high point had about 400 people, but it certainly didn't start there. And so the story goes about um, Camp Carson is that a couple individuals in around 1861 or so were um, hunting along the Grand Run River. And in an area 
mostly between halfway between La Grande and North Powder, Oregon. It's a really mountainous area. Uh, the Grand Run River, um, like today, uh, runs through much of this region and is a really an economic force um, as people set up towns along the Grand Ron. Well, these two individuals hunting came across gold in the river and it soon became advertised in the local papers and in fact out east in some of the larger cities newspapers that you could come and find gold and find your riches. And what happened before too long is that um, individuals start setting up their own camps, um, fighting for mining locations, and then eventually it went into an organized business um, at the Camp Carson Mining District. But so mining camps, what is important to really think about is that it wasn't always men at the mining camps. You found a variety of individuals and in different ethnicities that were there that came together and brought their cultures to that place. And so what you had were banks that could process all the gold. And uh, we don't directly know of a bank at Camp Carson, but there was indeed a general store and a post office that could have served that purpose. Um, there were schools and uh, we happen to know at Camp Carson that there were children there as well as families um, and their descendants live in the region. Um, sometimes at the bigger camps, you might have had theaters where um, performers came in and, and did shows for them. And um, something that is in many of the towns in the West is that uh, the Masons came into the area and set up um, their uh, interactions with each other and Masons. And then uh, what's normally thought of is that you have saloons, uh, newspapers, and bordellas. And what happened is it's really a way to um, keep especially the men entertained. Um, and newspapers are a way to really keep in contact with family and the rest of the world. Um, many of the individuals were literate at the mining camps. And in fact, um, it was fairly common to organize and set up your rules and governing laws at these mining camps. Um, and what's interesting too is for the churches. Um, we don't know of a church at uh, Camp Carson, but in some nearby towns that were within um, horseback riding, we do know of individuals that went on into the um, on Sundays when they weren't working to go into the church. Um, many of these small towns near the mining districts also did church dances and things like that to encourage the men to spend their money. And what we do know about Camp Carson is that that did indeed happen. Um, folks would go into La Grande or to North Powder, um, which is about 30 miles distance either way, and or to some of the other towns like Sumter um, were really attractive places to go to. So housing at, uh, at these mines really vary greatly. Um, some of them, like the one in the, on the left side of the screen, is a wall tent, a canvas wall tent. Um, it is iconic with miners across the entire West, all the way up to Alaska, down into California, and was a really portable thing that miners could do and was relatively affordable um, and easily packed. Um, the other thing too is that you might have little shanty houses like the two men in the lower corner that they just put together with local wood um, and it would survive for the short time while they were working on getting the gold. And then finally at Greenhorn, which is fairly near Camp Carson, a whole entire town developed. And so you could have expected folks from Camp Carson to go into Greenhorn to spend their money. And so it gives you a good idea of the kind of work that people were doing, how they lived and all. Now, to give you an idea too, at camps, healthcare was not all that good by any means. And you often had folks coming through selling all sorts of medicines that may or may not have been good for you, but people are buying it. Um, part of the problem with the healthcare um, at mines and including Camp Carson was the sewage. 
as well as any pollutants that came in from the mining. Um, sewage is that you didn't necessarily have any kind of septic system and things like that. Um, people generally used outhouses that eventually drained into the water systems in the area. Um, and so it was a real concern and there were problems with cholera and other things. The other <laughs> major issues had to do with infections and STDs. Um, this was before you had any kind of antibiotics. But um, for the STDs, there were all sorts of creams that were marketed to individuals. And you'll see later on in the presentation a slide of one of these very kinds of creams that we found at um, Camp Carson that was used for sexually transmitted diseases. The other thing too, along with these traveling folks is that they would sell medicines. And I have an example here of cocaine tablets um, that would be used for people that they could sleep with um, and to take care of the pain because working in a mine is really brutal work and you work six days a week or if not seven and it's very hard on your body and literally really a young person's um, job. Um, as you got older it became really difficult to work in these kinds of jobs. The other thing around healthcare were dietary issues. Um, food could be incredibly expensive to buy in the mines. Um, you couldn't necessarily hunt and fish continuously because you would hunt and fish out everything and it would become a barren place. And so what happened is many of these towns, just like Camp Carson, uh, develop relationships with ranches or farms nearby. And we happen to know at Camp Carson, um, not too far away from it is a, a farm and actually a meadow where um, an, a farmer uh, raised food and um, provided beef for the camp and would haul it up and sell it to the individuals. Um, the other thing too that thinking about the dietary things that we found at Camp Carson besides evidence of beef consumption there was also sheep being brought into the area that they would use too. Um, insects uh, became a significant problem in the area. And um, there were all sorts of different kinds of chemicals and things that people used in their tents and otherwise, somewhat similar to what we have today, um, but a little bit more toxic. <laughs> and then finally, a significant issue with tuberculosis. Um, what you would find in those wall tents or the small houses, you know, you might have a dozen men crammed into a one room house. And if anyone had tuberculosis, it would spread incredibly quickly through there. And so it was a significant problem. And again, before you had any antibiotics to treat it. And so it was um, a place where if you got ill, um, you could easily end up dying. And there are actually stories um, up at Camp Carson that individuals who came from the East Coast who had never camped out, didn't know how to survive, read a few books about mining and came, that they ended up dying or freezing to death because they didn't know what to do at all. So to give you an idea of the cost of the foods, um, this is from an advertisement um, on the East Coast but it would have applied pretty much to this region too, is that it was fairly costly for somebody um, to buy food. And some of this is, if not more than what we spend on food today. So it's pretty costly. Um, and what happened is, is that when people had a lot of money, they would buy a lot of these supplies and they would also buy food from traveling um, individuals who would sell all sorts of exotic foods and they would buy it. And so um, at many mining districts, just like at Camp Carson, if they had the money, they would buy a lot of this food. And if they didn't have much, they survived a lot on flour and fat and sugar and things like that and whatever they, else they could get. So it was really difficult for people um, to survive overall. Now, I'm not going to read this whole list, but I thought you might be interested in it, is that there were a lot of publications that went out about what people should take with them when they were going to be a minor. 
Um, and there were a lot of how-to books, um, not necessarily written by individuals that were minors or knew what they were doing. But here's an example of a kit that somebody might buy. You could go to a store and purchase this um, and head off to go and mine. Um, what happened is many of these things necessarily didn't last all that long and or um, people didn't know how to use them, um, ironically so. And going along with this, um, there were um, publications about what you should wear. So uh, at Camp Carson, it's around six to 7,500 feet um, in elevation. Um, it has been known even in recent years to get 10 or 15 feet of snow up there. Um, what we do know um, from one of the remaining houses that were at Camp Carson is that it, it was a two-story house that actually you could enter in from the roof in the winter. So it would snow that high and you couldn't get in any other way other than a ladder that went up to the roof with a hatch. Um, and so thinking about that, it also um, routinely got well below zero. Um, and, and snows would snar start in that at Camp Carson uh, in the early fall and could carry on until um, mid to late spring. And so you would have a short period of time that you would really work hard. And if you ended up staying there, you needed um, really warm clothing and protective clothing um, that would um, protect you from that environment. And so um, many of these things are really excellent kinds of clothing and items, but what many individuals ended up doing is that they would sell them when they were out of money in gold mining and would end up really shorthanded in terms of protective gear. Um, and so it could be a really dangerous spot. So getting to some pictures at Camp Carson is this is one of the ways actually into Camp Carson. It's a picture of someone delivering food um, uh, to the mining district. And this is actually the way I hiked in the very first time I went to Camp Carson. It didn't look like this. It was overgrown with trees, but still had the remnants of a two track trail left over from wagons um, that were bringing in food, as well as um, as it moved into um, having cars and trucks in the especially early 20th century, it left those tracks. And it's a fairly steep incline. It takes about 25 minutes or so to hike up um, with a fit person, but it's pretty treacherous in terms of climbing up there. And at the very base of that hill is the Grand Run River um, that also brought in food along the river uh, into the camp um, and people could send things out. Um, this is actually um, for the first few times when I took students out, we hiked in that way. And ironically, it turned out that we had to make a change in plans because I was wearing out my students before we even got to the camp to do work at it. Um, it was just a really tough um, climb in. Um, and we ended up uh, making a change and it was a longer hike in, but pretty flat um, to get in. But uh, it gives you an idea of what it looked like up there. Now, what uh, was used to mine at Camp Carson was water and hydraulic mining. And there was and still is a pretty sophisticated system of a reservoir that would hold the water. And they had laid out metal pipes all throughout the mining district to really focus the water. And so you would have pipes that were big enough for a person to crawl into all the way down to one and two inch pipes. And what they did is use the elevation and the water moving down to where they were mining to have the pressure. And so this photo is an actual example of an individual at Camp Carson using the water pressure from that reservoir that went all through that area. And um, it's something for any of the folks listening in, you do find these kind of um, pathways around the mines with reservoirs and uh, pipes that are all interlinked 
to really use for this kind of mining. And they're still there. Um, throughout much of the mining district, you, the, the pipes and the equipment that were used at Camp Carson were left behind um, for us to look at and examine. Um, and so this gives you an idea too of what it looks like. These are really old photos. But um, the one on the left shows how they were using the water and bringing it in. And you would have had a pipe that went down that they used for spraying. Um, and it was really high velocity water. And the one on the right is really the main mining pit. Um, and it originally, that area, um, you would have had all the way up to the tree line, it would have been full earth and trees. And so they've cut down, um, uh, you know, well over 150 feet down into the earth to do the mining. And then they would sluice it. And so up on the hill ridge where you see the trees, there's actually a pathway that you can hike into Camp Carson to the main town. And so people would do that routinely every day and hike down along the side of uh, the mining pit and then do the mining and the hydraulic mining. Um, there are quite a few um, pits. This is the biggest one, but there are other ones that are still present today. And in fact, at the base, there is some of the historic mining equipment that was just left there. Um, they didn't haul it out after it was abandoned. Um, so, so here, let me go back. So it had really significant environmental impacts um, for the region and for the people still living there um, that are fairly significant. Um, there were folks that actually wintered over, and this is as we move into the um, earlier 20th century or so um, to mid, is that there were a number of houses. What's fortunate is that um, there are maps that the Forest Service had that shows the layout of the town. And it gave us a really good picture of where to do testing um, for the houses to look for artifacts um, that really told about the lives of the people there. And so that really helped out a lot. Um, in general, at many of these mining camps, and especially at Camp Carson, you found folks that developed permanent residences and would winter over. And it could be um, fairly isolating uh, to be up there. Um, Today, um, to travel from LaGrande to Camp Carson, it takes about an hour and a half driving down the interstate and then going on a state highway and then a forest service road. And so it takes some time. And if there was an emergency, it'd be tough to get out um, overall. Now, what I had mentioned before at the beginning of the presentation is that there is definite evidence of family life. And here's a picture of it is that families were up there with their kids and it really had developed into a true community. Um, uh, in the heyday, it was at 400. As it went on into the 20th century, it whittled down just, just a few families overall. Um, but there is definite av evidence of family life as well as uh, really uh, elaborate houses, um, picket fences, things like that, that gave evidence of that kind of lifestyle. Um, what we know is in between the early 20th century and to the 1970s, there were almost no pictures. And part of that has to do with really World War II. Um, as we moved into World War II is that the mining was really shut down, especially for gold. It became uh, illegal to have your own gold. Uh, and it was really heavily controlled. And many of these young individuals, the men were heading off um, to fight in World War II. And so it just lingered on for a while with a few individuals still doing mining on this area. Um, and what you see here is a picture from the 70s where most of the houses had been abandoned. Uh, there weren't many people living up there. And it was an interesting time period, at least in terms of archaeology and preservation. And part of that had to do with choices that the Forest Service were making about these isolated camps. Um, many of these houses, you know, really proved dangerous and could fall down if people got into them. And at, 
what we do know at Camp Carson, there was a decision made to burn down many of these houses. And so um, it was before many of the archeological <laughs> laws were in, in effect. And what happened is, you know, we only have remnants of most of the houses left on the ground and or they collapsed. Um, fortunately, we have one house that survived. Um, so it gave you an idea of what they look like. Um, but definitely we, at least in terms of archeological uh, perspective and research, you know, we lost out on some of the information that we could gain from it. So what turned out though, is that as we moved into the 1980s, there were, was a French conglomerate business that decided to um, get a permit and mine up at Camp Carson. And so it would have been a forest service permit. Um, and what happened is they brought in a lot of equipment and what we see layered out all over the mining district is a whole set of new kinds of pipes. It's really the plastic piping that came in that they decided to do hydraulic mining to, similar to what had been done um, really a hundred years before. But it turned out they brought in all this heavy equipment and it turned out to be so incredibly expensive to do hydraulic mining that they went bankrupt. And so um, they only lasted a few years and brought in a number of people, um, but really it didn't survive at all. And so the remnants that we have up there is mostly the um, plastic piping um, that's in the district. So moving into that, right now um, there is um, primarily one individual that has a mining permit up there. Um, he has to do a little bit of mining every year to maintain the permit since it's on federal land and, and permitted that way. But what I wanted to share with you are some of the artifacts um, that really told us a lot about how people lived up there and the connections they had locally to the Northwest as well as all over the world. And so um, this is a really incredible bottle and it's amazing that many of these things survived um, well over a hundred years out in the elements. Um, and this is an Alan Lewis uh, ketchup bottle um, right out of um, and produced in Portland, Oregon. And uh, it's pretty cool. It tells you about the history and the kinds of products that were being brought in to support the mine. Um, and uh, it's a pretty cool bottle overall. Uh, the other thing too is that when you're mining, um, Coffee and tea were big things at the mines. And part of that is they were boiling water to be safe. But this is a Brazil coffee tin um, from uh, the 19th century. And it, we found a number of these up at Camp Carson. So it was brought in. So you had international food products being brought in. And it turns out during the 1800s, uh, Brazil produced the vast majority of coffee that people were drinking in the world. And it really ties in that with that international flavor of people from all over the world coming in and the kinds of things that they desired to have there. Um, the other thing in terms of uh, connections between the Two Dragon camp, which is where the Chinese men were working versus the main camp that were really the white miners. This is glazed stoneware that were commonly used by the Chinese during that time period that held all sorts of things like soy and medicine and things like that. We never found a full pot. Um, it looked, they look like many of them like uh, flower pots <laughs> with, a, with a spout uh, when you find the whole one. Um, but we found many of these large shards of the stoneware, um, which shows that there was interaction back and forth between the two camps. And, you know, a really important thing, hearkening back to the healthcare that I mentioned, is that in Northeast Oregon, uh, many of the healthcare providers were Chinese men. Um, we know in John Day, there was a Chinese doctor that was providing healthcare. Um, and we know there were Chinese um, medical providers um, in La Grande too, in our area of Chinatown in La Grande, Oregon. And so there's more than likely the white miners were reaching out to the Chinese for healthcare 
um, purposes too. So here is the um, poultice cream for the STDs. And we found a couple of these. Uh, and it, what's interesting about it is that it ties in with the stories that have been told about the mine and about what miners used at the time. And uh, what's exciting is that uh, with the kind of technology we have today, you can actually find an advertisement for it too. Um, it was used for a variety of things. Um, and, you know, I don't know necessarily how great it was, but it was used for many different purposes of infections, STDs, sunburns, things like that, and um, was widely found um, at the mine. The other thing is, as we move into a smaller group of people at the mine, as we move into the mid 20th century, is that we got a wide variety of items. And uh, for me, one of the more surprising things was the Lucerne cottage cheese. And it's actually a metal tin. Um, and I never had realized until we found this that you could get uh, cottage cheese in a metal container. And this is the same product that's sold at Safeway today, uh, the Lucerne products. Um, other things that were popular that went along with the tea and coffee were all sorts of creamers. We found dozens of lids of creamers and coffee and things like that um, throughout the mining district. Um, it was one of the most common item that we found um, and uh, gives you an idea of the kinds of things people are eating. The other thing too are sweeteners. So one thing to point out at many of these uh, mining camps is that the food quality wasn't all that great. And so you often use ketchup and sweeteners and things like that uh, to make the meats palpable and or to add on with oatmeal and porridges and things like that. And so uh, the sorghum, uh, the sweet sorghum actually comes from Wisconsin and else love is an Oregon product. Um, and so many, we found many sweeteners that people were using uh, at Camp Carson. Another thing, and this is to me one of the more impressive things is lead glass. Uh, I was surprised beyond belief <laughs> is that we went to, on, you know, like three years into doing research, we went to a new area um, to excavate. It's a whole new class teaching archaeology. And barely under the ground was this depression glass bowl. It's fairly big. We're missing one little segment out of it, but it's incredibly beautiful and was um, used at Camp Carson. Um, so it's early 20th century. The other thing tied in with mid 20th century is uranium glass. And if uh, nobody knows about it is that it was incredibly popular to have things made out of uranium. Um, not necessarily safe for you, but it was popular and all sorts of dishes and things were made out of uranium. In fact, I know growing up, uh, my mom had a few of these stuck away. She never used them for dishes anymore, but it was something that she, had, she hung on to and showed. Uh, uh, from the 50s, but we found a number of pieces of uranium glass um, and people actually, when they were producing it originally, they used it for serving vessels and things like that. Um, now we know it was incredibly unsafe, um, but we found a number of these. Uh, the th another common item, bare aspirin. Uh, this actually ties in with uh, early World War II um, this actual bottle of bear, and it has an interesting connection to Germany. Um, bear originally has a connection to it because they were producing it in Germany and tied with World War II. But it makes sense at a mining camp that you would be having using painkillers and things like that at the camp. And luckily, we found a few of these bears bottles that had not been destroyed at all. So. Thinking about the kind of research we've done at Camp Carson, there are a number of things that 
I've really found while we're up there is that it stands as really a fairly complex community. Uh, you had people from all over the world that came to this region um, in a fairly isolated area of Northeast Oregon uh, to try to make their fortune. Um, many of them ended up staying in this region um, and their descendants are still here. What has been interesting all along is that uh, there are a couple things that we have not located. And part of that is, is that we do know at Camp Carson, there was, we found the store location, more than likely the post office. Um, there was also a hotel that we know where that is um, because what was left over was a, a fireplace that was still standing just out in the middle of nowhere. But what was the more two interesting things we haven't found is that they actually had electricity at Camp Carson. Um, and it's one of the earlier places that had electricity in Northeast Oregon, and we haven't found that station where they produced it. And so it's somewhere near the Grand Run River. We've hiked up and down the hills trying to figure out where it is, and we haven't found it. The other oddity is we have not found a cemetery. And um, it seems fairly odd there wouldn't be that one there since people were living um, with their families and there are plenty of individual miners up there and individuals would have died. Um, we haven't found it. Um, and uh, we're gonna keep trying. Um, I'm hoping to find it before I retire <laughs> sometime. And uh, the plans are to really continue taking students up there uh, so they can really experience archaeology in the area um, and get to do some applied research that's part of a long-term plan um, that the Wallowa Whitman National Forest has. So uh, thank you uh, for listening to my presentation. I really appreciate it. That was wonderful. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. And folks, you're welcome to submit your questions. Again, if you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a chat feature. Click on there and you can type in any questions that you have for Linda this evening. Um, and in the meantime, Linda, there are several things you mentioned that really surprised me. What's been the biggest surprise for you in the course of your research on this project? You know, my biggest surprise was finding evidence of a number of families up there. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of what you know, you know, we learn about mines is that it's primarily men. Um, most of the women supposedly were working as uh, sex workers and things like that. But it's pretty evident that there were families up there with children. And, um, and we, we found that in a number of locations in the camp um, where there was evidence of that in terms of toys and things like that. So um, do you want me to stop the share? So we can um, see the questions. Sure, yeah. Um, we have one coming from Madison. Thanks, Madison, for your question. Uh, they ask, what is the most interesting artifact you have found at Camp Carson? Oh, the most, I, I still think it's the lead bowl, um, that, that pink lead crystal. Mm -hmm. um, it was such an incredible surprise. And I was walking with one of my students and you know, we looked down and we saw a little tip of something out of the ground and took a trowel and scraped around a bit and saw this edge of this bowl. And we were both surprised beyond belief. Um, so that, that was really surprising to me. Um, so I see reasonable estimates of what was mined from this camp. I don't know in terms of volume, but there were certainly millions of dollars made during the heyday. So, you know, a little over a hundred years ago, there's at least two, three million dollars of at that time. Um, wow. Yeah, there it was a significantly big mine. And one way to think about that too is that um, just uh, south of that area in Baker City, you had the Bonanza mine nearby, um, and it's tied with the Geyser Grand, and it's one of the biggest mines in this region. Um, but there are significant gold veins throughout this area still today. Oh, and it's mostly, it's mostly gold ore. Um, 
there, um, there is a lot of quartz too. Um, and so um, it's become popular for folks to carry out the big quartz nodules, things like that. Interesting. Yeah. For those of you if who can't can see. find a way to really uh, efficiently mine the gold there, there's still plenty of gold, mm -hmm. <laughs> most definitely. And what does your research team look like? How many folks do you have working for you? How many students? And How many students? Um, over the years, um, it is, I've varied anywhere between uh, two or three students all the way up to 25. So it's really varied. Um, in the summer, I've often taken just a few individuals up there to do research, um, folks that are working on practicums and or capstones and things like that. And so they'll go up um, in the fall. Um, we generally take the full archaeology class up there when I'm teaching it. I trade off. Uh, there's two archaeologists at EOU. And so we trade off locations and years that we get to do it. So. Um, unfortunately, this past fall was my turn, but we had to do it remotely <laughs> because of COVID. So, um, Marsha asks, can you talk about who still has the mining permit for the area? Um, I don't know the name of the individual. Um, he, the land manager is the um, U.S. Forest Service, and so I don't know the name of the individual that has the mine. Um, he's elderly. Um, and so I've never interacted with him at all. Um, but he having the mining permit um, doesn't stop anybody from going out to that mining district. It doesn't mean you have total control over the land. It's still multi-purpose, just like um, Forest Service land is. Thank so you, you have access you. to it. Yeah. Um, what kind of records or evidence was found to support their use of electricity? Oh, it is, was actually documented in newspapers. And what we have too are folks that had um, interacted, especially with individuals um, in the early 20th century. We had a number of elderly individuals that when I first started that were still alive that told us stories of it when they were young men. And so um, they indicated that there was electricity up there. So. Kathy asks, um, said I have to I had to leave for just a minute when you were showing some of the artifacts when I returned I saw the remains of a depression glass bowl and I think I heard you call it first a lead glass bowl does it's that like mean lead crystal ah. yeah. and, it, and then they are most of them would be safe. Safe. <laughs> yeah I mean you could always have it tested mm. but uh, you know I've inherited some of those same kind of things Mm -hmm. um, Kathy asks, is it safe? Um, they have pieces of their grandparents' amber depression glass and love using them, but they'll, they'll stop if it's not safe. Yeah, to I would just test it to see if it's safe. How could one go about testing it? I think it? there are testing kits that you can get. Okay, wonderful. Thank yeah, you. yeah. But so, I have depression. I, I'm the youngest of six kids, and so I inherited a bunch of my parents' things, and so they were married during the depression. And so I inherited a lot of the class and I use the same things. So I'm not too worried. <laughs> it's sort of thinking of lead crystal that we can buy today, the really high quality crystal. Mm -hmm. so. Does anyone else have any other questions for us? If so, please feel free to submit them by that chat function or the Q and A. Let's see if I missed any. Um, yeah. Oh, who currently owns the land? Uh, the we do. <laughs> U.S. citizens. It's uh, it's uh, managed by the U.S. Forest Service, so it's federally managed land. Um, people who get permits, um, they can get permits on federal land, and you have to go through a permitting process um, for many things, including mining, and so. Um, the force us Wallowa whitman national forest is the land manager and then the permittee has access to do specific things including mining and they have to do um, maintenance and do mining every year um so can people go sightseeing in that area you certainly could hike in uh and so it's federal land people can go in uh 
What I would caution is don't pick up anything and carry it out. Um, uh, it still falls under federal archaeological laws. And so even if you find historic items and things like that, um, you know, just look at them, don't pick them up and move them around. That would hold true for any archaeological site. You, you don't want to, you want to leave it alone. If someone happened to find something of particular interest, they need to leave it alone, but what, should they try and document it and let somebody know? Um, what you could do is um, take a picture of it. And what I would say is submit it to the Wallowa Whitman National Forest. Um, the South Zone archeologist is Eric Harvey. Um, and you could contact him there and, and let him know. Yeah, he knows the area really well. So, oh, Kathy asks, they say, I, I do have a piece of pottery that was pulled up by a commercial fishing boat along the western coast of the United States. It looks a lot like the piece of pottery you mentioned that has a spout. Uh, yeah. I wonder what it was used for. I was told it was for Chinese gin or some kind of pot, maybe. Um, those pots were used for lots of different things. For medicine, sometimes they put alcohol in it. Um, um, they, some even had soy in it, like, and things like that. So um, they've been called gin pots, soy pots, um, medicine pots, all sorts of things. Um, some of them too, um, they were like, um, they looked like flower pots sort of with a spout, but you also had some that were larger that you could do double burners on that they might cook medicine in. Interesting. So I actually, I worked at a site in downtown LaGrande where the um, public library is right now that is, was really where Chinatown was. And we found a lot of them, a lot of those um, intact pots. So yeah, you're, you got the right information, it, it, alcohol pot. That's great. Okay, well, that looks like it for questions. Thank you, everyone, for submitting such great questions this evening. We appreciate it. And Linda, thank you again so much yeah, for joining us and sharing your research. Absolutely fascinating. Um, ooh. Oh, one can more question come in? Can one come see you and talk about your work? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be, well, now that, you know, we, we're all getting our shots, but definitely is that um, I have, I've been using the artifacts that we've, some of them that we've taken off of Camp Carson as really a teaching collection too now. And the Wallow, Wallow National Forest has been so incredibly supportive of it. And so if people wanted to come and uh, learn more from me, they can make an appointment. Um, we're funny. not um, necessarily allowing um, visitors right now, but probably the best time would be in the fall when we really open up. Hopefully, COVID restrictions would lower, right? But yeah, you can certainly come and meet with me. Yeah, I would love it. Show me that. Yeah. I've got quite a few containers of artifacts from Camp Carson. Wonderful. Well, yeah. thank you again, everyone. Thank you, Linda, so much for sharing your research. And I hope everyone has a good evening. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. Bye-bye. Huh?